Hello and welcome everybody to Synthetic Opinion, the life science podcast. This is Linus and today we're going to talk about an incredibly versatile class of natural substances, the monoterpenoid indole alkaloids, or in short, the MIAs. They include everything from opioids, aphrodisiacs, anti-cancer medicines and even psychedelic compounds, all deriving from just one single common core structure. But how is it possible to get such an incredible array of effects from just one chemical backbone? Which organisms produce them in nature and why? And very importantly, how can we utilize them for our own well-being? Today we talk with a natural substance researcher, former MIT professor and newly appointed Max Planck Institute director Sarah O'Connor about the potentials and current mysteries regarding the mere substance class. Welcome Sarah. Hello Linus, it's good to be here. To get a better picture of what the mere substance class is all about, let's check out some outstanding examples of what they can do. You just recently published a paper with Scott Farrow, Omar Kamelin, Lorenzo Caputi, among others, about the biosynthesis of the psychedelic compound ibogaine. Can you explain to us what this substance is and what your paper was about? Sure. Um, just a little bit of the history of how I got to know about this compound. Um, in 2014, I got a phone call in my office from a researcher at New York University, Kenneth Alper, and he told me about this compound, and he was very interested in its uh, possibilities to cure or treat heroin addiction. And apparently, um, in the 1960s, a man named Harold Lotsoff uh, took ibogaine uh, because he knew that it had hallucinogenic properties because of it was used in religious ceremonies in certain mm -hmm. African tribes, um, and he wanted to see what it was all about. And after he took this compound, he happened to notice that he had no more cravings for heroin. And then he went and he did the control experiment. He got himself addicted to heroin again, and then he retook <laughs> ibogaine, and again his cravings diminished. So this opened up a really exciting possibility that we have a compound that may mitigate uh, the, the effects of heroin addiction. <laughs> well, <laughs> so to get this straight, this guy, he had no intention on treating his heroin addiction, no. and this was a mere completely unexpected side effect. It was a complete accident, yes. Okay, and then he actually pursued it and got addicted again on purpose, he says. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's quite a veto. <laughs> um, anyway, and I have to warn you, um, unfortunately, ibogaine also has some cardiac side effects. So mm -hmm. this is why it's not currently more widely used, um, because you have to be very, very careful about monitoring uh, your your heart while, while you mm -hmm. take this compound. Yeah, but I see how this gives us more than enough reason to research it, especially in light of the current and ongoing opiate crisis in the USA and elsewhere. Absolutely. I also have to say from a chemical perspective, I was very excited about this compound um, because in nature, um, we often see things that are mirror images of each other. And I have to remind all of the non-scientists in the audience that mirror images are not the same thing. And mm -hmm. if you want a way to prove that to yourself, look at your two hands and put them together and you can see that they're a mirror image each, of each other. But then if you try to lay one on top of the other, you see that you just can't do it. Your thumb and your pinky is always going to be in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So your hands are mirror images of each other, but they are not identical. <laughs> and in nature, many molecules are like this and they are called enantiomers. And yep. it turns out that ibogaine has an enantiomer. And I was very excited about the prospect of being able to compare and contrast how nature synthesizes both pairs of enantiomers. So in 2018, with uh, Lorenzo Caputi, uh, we discovered how the one enantiomer of ibogaine was made. And this is actually eventually incorporated into an anti-cancer molecule called Vimblastin. Um, and mm. then in 2019, Scott and others and I figured out how the ibogaine and antiomer yeah. was made. So these functionally completely different compounds, like the psychedelic compound ibogaine and the anti-cancer medicines vinblastin and vincristine, they share a common biosynthetic pathway up to a point and only from then branch off into these completely different functional molecules. That's correct. Do they happen to be uh, produced in the same plants, or are these then different plants? So there are an estimated 3,000 or so MIA compounds in nature. 
Uh, some plants produce lots of neas. So the plant Catharanthus roseus, for example, uh, Madagascar periwinkle, which produces uh, vimblastin and vincristine, produces maybe a hundred or so different mias. And some of those mias um, look very different, but they are uh, all made from the same starting compound. Um, that being said, um, some mias are only found in certain plants, while other mias are found in other plants. So uh, ibogaine is made in the plant Tabernanthe iboga, whereas vimblastin is made in Catharanthus roseus. But then how can it be that compounds that are chemically so related have so different biological effects? I mean, the ibogaine has a psychedelic effect, as you said. This means it changes the human consciousness and perception and mind. Whereas these anti-cancer medicines, vinblastin and vincristin, have completely different effects. So it's very difficult to predict the biological activity of a molecule. People are constantly trying to think of ways in which we, we, can, we can explore this or investigate this better and in a more time-effective manner. Um, one thing that we do believe that we know um, is that plants make these compounds for some sort of um, some sort of function. So somehow these compounds are helping the plants to survive in their environment, whether they're serving some kind of defensive purpose, whether they're acting as signaling molecules, whether they're helping the plants communicate with their environment somehow, these molecules have some kind of biological function. And so these molecules have evolved um, to be able to, to interact with biological systems. And a number of um, drug discovery companies and pharmaceutical companies have named these natural substances privileged scaffolds. Mm. In other words, um, because they've been selected over millions of years to have biological activity, um, they're very good at interacting with receptors and enzymes and all of the things that we find in the human body that typically serve as drug targets. Ah, so the idea is to have a molecular scaffold that already fits lots of, for example, receptor binding sites or molecular binding sites in proteins and then make derivatives of this scaffold biologically so that the exact binding behavior changes and gives rise to a multitude of different acting modes. Yeah, exactly. Huh? So vimblastin uh, happens to uh, fight or uh, treat cancer uh, by binding to microtubules in humans and thereby stop cell uh, cycle arrest. We have no idea whether that's what it's doing in the plant, um, but mm. nevertheless, that's, that's what it does in humans. Hmm. Yeah, that's actually a good question. Obviously, the plant isn't killing itself with these compounds, so there must be some kinds of safety mechanism for the plant itself, right? You said, especially in the Madagascar periwinkle, there are maybe hundreds of Mia compounds. What do we know about them? <laughs> yeah, so I think it's about 130 that are yeah, produced uh. in uh, Madagascar periwinkle. And I think we, along with some other groups around the world, have made pretty good progress in elucidating um, many of the compounds found in this plant. Um, I think that once um, you manage to uh, discover the genes and the enzymes that are encoded by these genes um, for a, a small number of, of the compounds found in this plant, you can use some bioinformatic tricks to have those genes lead you to the remaining genes. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of knowledge really kind of helps accelerate the discovery of the remaining biosynthetic oh. pathways. So this means the first steps are the hardest, but after that you can um, find maybe similar gene clusters to the ones that you already know in the rest of the genome. Yeah. Yes, um, I definitely think that the first steps are hardest. Um, Unfortunately, uh, you mentioned gene clusters. So mm -hmm. in microbes, um, these natural substances um, are typically encoded uh, by genes that are all grouped together in little islands on the genome. Mm -hmm. um, in plants, that's often not the case. And typically, mm -hmm. each individual gene is in a different place on the genome. So you can't really use the physical local location of the gene as, as, a, as a clue. But nevertheless, there are other bioinformatic techniques that we can use to accelerate the discovery of these genes. For example, um, oftentimes all the genes of a biosynthetic pathway will have a very similar expression profile in different tissues. And so we try to map the patterns of the expression levels of all the genes 
and mm. find genes that have similar expression profiles. Uh, following the idea that things that are regulated the same way are also functionally connected to each other. Exactly, uh. yes. Yeah, that's an interesting approach. Although I can imagine that maybe you find a lot of genes who are oh, <laughs> co yeah. co regulated at one specific point in time or in one tissue, then how do you screen through all these candidates that you find with your method? It's a, it's a long and tedious process. <laughs> and uh, we have um, a number of different ways that we can do it. Um, we'll clone out the genes and we'll express them in E. coli or some easy to work with heterologous organism and then assay the enzyme using biochemical methods. Um, and that's, that's hard work, but we mm -hmm. can typically assay hundreds of different genes. Um, and sometimes we try to silence the gene in the plant itself. So we, um, we can silence the gene in Catharanthus roseus. Mm -hmm. This may be being one of the last steps uh, in this process because it's usually hard to silence a gene in a plant. It's definitely okay. not a high throughput method, but yeah. if we get very desperate and um, we can't think of a good biochemical assay, then that's, that's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. that, that being said, we're always looking for ways to try to streamline the gene discovery process. So we're always looking for new bioinformatic techniques and new sequence techniques that will help us to get better lists of gene candidates and to screen through them more quickly. Mm -hmm. Regarding streamlining this uh, process of finding candidate genes and characterizing them and then even producing the compounds, you just in the beginning of this year joined a EU Horizon 2020 project called Miami, based on the word MIAS in this case, <laughs> not on the city in the US. Um, what is your role in this project or what is this project all about? So this is a very exciting project. So um, as we discussed a few minutes ago, many of these MIAs have important pharmacological activity, but they're produced in plants that aren't necessarily easy to get a hold of, or they're not very easy to grow. So the idea is if we can find all of the biosynthetic genes that encode one of these molecules, we could put them in an organism that is easy to grow, namely mm -hmm. yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Mm -hmm. The standard yeast that basically everybody knows from cooking also, from, from baking. From baking bread, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, and it just turns out that yeast is very easy to work with, and uh, you can put lots of different genes into it and, um, and take some time and optimize the gene expression properly. Um, you can get the yeast to synthesize a, a MIA molecule for you. So one of the reasons why we're excited about this project, it's partly because of the commercial impact um, in that we can use these yeast strains to produce these valuable molecules that are used as drugs, um, but also kind of dovetailing with our interests in gene discovery. If we have these robust systems in place um, where we've uh, been able to successfully express part of a MIA pathway, then we can use that as a tool to screen for new biosynthetic genes. So we can just very, very quickly transform in all of our gene candidates into that strain of yeast and then look to see um, if any of any of those additional genes helps to make the desired product. Mm -hmm. So there's a promise floating around since decades basically to unlock much more commercial potential out of the biological knowledge and bioengineering methods. And although much progress was made, there's still the big breakthrough missing to catapult the biotechnology realm into, for example, what is a computer technology for us right now. Now, you, the Miami Project, and of course many other projects across the world are working on this. But what are some actual newly developed technologies that streamline and speed up the biotechnological development process? Well, for example, we have much better cloning methods. So mm. um, we can now call up a company and ask them to synthesize 100 genes for us. And they can do it very cheaply, and they can put them already in our desired expression vector. So we can just wait three or four weeks, and then we get a big package in the mail with all of our genes ready to go. So that is a huge advantage, mm -hmm. first of all. Um, we also have very nice ways now of integrating those genes into the yeast genome. So this technique called um, CRISPR-Cas, or gene editing, um, has now been worked out very well for Saccharomyces, and it's a very 
now streamlined process to take our MIA genes um, and to introduce them stably into the yeast chromosome in a very efficient and streamlined manner. So imagine you have a set of genes that you know um, in combination produce a certain MIA compound and you put all these genes into yeast. How do you make sure that these genes also fit together in yeast and are regulated in the right way so that they make biological sense in the organism and simply work? Oh, that's a really <laughs> difficult question. Um, and we actually, we do very little of this. So this is really the um, area of expertise of our collaborator, um, Michael Jensen, who's mm. in Copenhagen. And Michael is um, a metabolic engineer, and this is exactly what he's very good at. And um, he and his group um, are, have a, a great sense of being able to take these different genes, put them on different promoters, put them, uh, give them different copy numbers and expression levels in the yeast and be able to effectively play around with, with those parameters to try to optimize the production levels of this compound. So our role is a little bit more to um, discover the genes and to understand the chemistry of the enzymes that those genes encode. And then Michael and his metabolic engineering colleagues really do the, the hard work of optimizing the production, getting them into yeast and then optimizing the production in yeast. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. This sounds like um, synthetic biology approaches mm -hmm. where things are a little bit more uh, standardized or efforts are made to yeah. standardize things, right? Mm -hmm. Then what would you recommend to anybody who's maybe interested in pursuing a career in science and, for example, to go into the field of natural product research or synthetic biology, metabolic engineering, the things we just talked about? Mm -hmm. what, what should they study is, is what you're asking. Yes, for example. Okay. Uh, well, I think there are many different paths that you can take to get into this area. So, for example, I was a chemistry major when I was an undergraduate at university, mm. and, um, and I actually got my degree, uh, my PhD degree in chemistry. So I think that influences me in that I tend to be very interested in the, um, the enzyme reactions that are being catalyzed and trying to understand exactly how those enzymatic reactions work and being able to very rigorously understand the structures of the starting materials and the products and how you get from one to the other. Um, mm -hmm. I think if um, you have more of an engineering mentality or predilection, um, you can major in some kind of engineering um, in university. And in fact, many universities now have bioengineering majors. Mm -hmm. And so people who are trained in that area um, are typically going to learn more about um, the ideas of being able to develop a producing organism that will make a molecule. So you'll learn about things like metabolic flux, you'll learn about things about what are the cellular properties that impact the yield of a natural substance, so what are the problems of getting from A to Z um, in a natural cell, what are all the different things that can go wrong and what types of things can you do to, to bypass those problems? Yeah, so there are already lots of different courses in many universities that are specialized in synthetic biology or metabolic engineering teaching. Correct. But there seem to be many different ways to get into this kind of science. When we have, for example, a look into your group who obviously did a lot of research in this field and have many very high-ranking publications. What are their backgrounds? I really try to encourage people from lots of different backgrounds to join the group because I think um, we wouldn't learn as much from each other and we wouldn't do as many new things if we all came from exactly the same background. So um, a, a specifically, a good fraction of us uh, come from biochemical backgrounds, so mm -hmm. a good fraction of people are interested in looking at enzymes, how enzymes work, um, and being able to do biochemical assays and, and understand enzymatic reactions. Um, we have a couple of people who are chemists, um, so they're very interested in synthesizing molecules. Um, and uh, being able to compare and contrast how we make molecules synthetically versus how nature makes them. Uh, we have um, sometimes cell biologists in the lab, 
And these people are very interested in the specific types of cells that make natural products and why those cells um, make these natural products and, and, and why those cells and not other cells in the plant, for example. Um, we sometimes do have engineers in the group. I can convince a, a chemical mm -hmm. or a biological engineer to join the group and um, they teach us a little bit of um, metabolic engineering and we teach them some enzymology. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I mean, lots and lots of different types of, of, of people in, in the group, I think makes for very, very interesting science. What would you recommend then as a strategy to get into this kind of science and pursue a career in this direction? Rather joining a well-established group and do whatever they're doing right now, or maybe even coming up with their own project idea and then going to some research group that fits this idea, uh, be it a famous and very known group or a smaller and newer one. Um, so I think when you're considering doing your PhD, the most important thing is you have to be extremely excited about the project that you're going to be working on. Because getting a PhD is very, very hard work. So if you're not extremely excited about it in the beginning, there's no way you're going to survive to the end. So that's the most important thing, to make sure that you're very excited about the project. Um, in terms of whether you take a, a, a pre-existing project assigned by your advisor or you develop a project completely on your own, actually, I think a hybrid of the two is the thing that works best. Mm. So when you join a research group, you really want to be working um, within you don't want to be doing anything too, too different from what the rest of the people in the research group are doing because you really want to rely on that research group to help you answer questions and to provide support. And, and it's just, it's, it's too difficult to be attacking a, a research problem all on your own in isolation. That just doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, part of being a PhD student means that you kind of take a general idea that might have been provided by your advisor and you really develop it. And um, you take it in new directions and hopefully in new directions that are more exciting and unexpected than your PhD advisor would have, would have ever have imagined. Um, and whether you pick a well-established research group or a newer research group or a less well-established research group, my advice is to visit the research laboratory before you join, talk to the people in the research lab, talk, talk to the PI and talk to the people in the group, and you'll know whether or not it's a good, it would be a good fit for you. You just get the feeling by getting to know the people and just have human to human uh, conversation. Yeah, I think yeah. science is not really about just working in isolation at a bench without any type of interaction with people. Um, you actually have to have a lot of interaction with people when you're a scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you just mentioned, um, everybody that comes in your group, for example, no matter what their background is, they have to prepare to learn a lot about all the other fields that are involved in a complex research issue, right? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, for taking your time, sharing your insights, and for this incredible interview. We will follow up on the newest research regarding the MIA substances and EU 2020 projects like Miami. I hope you and all our listeners enjoyed this very first episode of Synthetic Opinion, the life science podcast. If you want, you can follow Sarah's lab and us on Facebook and Twitter. I wish you all a good day and bye for now. Thank you, Linus.